we recorded this live on Twitch today. Blend shapes are only on pro version. Wow, repeating only has two on the free version? I'm quite in I'm I'm learning things today now. Wait, copy and pasting mesh is only on the pro version? Are you joking? <laughs> that's that's hmm. Don't know how I feel about that one. All right, so let's go through the questions from you guys. So the first question we have from Kara. How exactly does bringing in new slash replacing art meshes work? Well, let's go ahead and try it out then. So we're going to go ahead and grab a new PSD, for example. So this can be an exact version of what you have with new parts. Or it could be something completely different. So we're going to try and grab these planets in. Once you drag it into the window, it will come up with create new model or with the model you're currently on. You're going to make sure to select the one that you're on. Otherwise, it will create its own file. Now you'll notice this. It will say add all layers as a new art mesh. Register without adding or replace. Now, I wouldn't recommend clicking replace because it will replace every single art mesh and that can cause some issues. If you're going to add new parts, it's probably better to use the second option unless you're using a file with just a single or maybe two layers on it, like this one, then you could use the top option. So we're going to go ahead and select this. Now, that's going to look like it didn't add anything. However, in our project menu at the top left here, if we open this up and source image, you'll see that a new PSD has appeared right below our first one. And this is going to have our new art mesh on it. So if you were looking to add this in as a new part first, what you would need to do is select it, right click and create model image. Next, you'll want to click on model guide image. And then you'll see today's date on it. It will have our new part in there. And then we want to select create art mesh. There we go. So that's popped it up on our canvas now. And then obviously from here, you'll want to edit the draw order and the formers and all of that jazz. But that is now a part within your model. If you were looking to replace on the other hand, it's a little bit easier. So let's say with the face here, obviously this isn't a face part, but we can show how this works. What we're going to want to do is select our face, right click our part, and then set input image for model image of selected art mesh. This is going to look very cursed. I apologize. So that's replaced it with what we have. So it's not showing right now because of the mesh around here. If I pop this up, it's there basically. Now this will always put it where it is on the canvas. So if you're editing your model in particular, make sure that you're using the same canvas size. I would recommend just using the original PSD that you were using to edit and do not change the canvas size because otherwise they'll be slightly off center when you do import them in. And then you have to go through the effort of moving everything into place. So our next question from Nixie the Vampy. What's your work routine for rigging and where do you begin? Where do you end? I feel intimidated. <laughs> There's no reason to feel intimidated with Live 2D. It is a very time consuming process and it does require quite a bit of patience. I will warn you on that one. But there's no reason to be too intimidated by it. It's just a lot. You've got to sit down for a little while, to get things done. However, for my particular work routine, and this does vary depending on what rigger you ask, it all depends on personal preferences, I'd say. But for me and I guess a majority of people that I find, it's head down. So we will start working on the head first, including the facial features. Generally, I will start with the facial features and then the head movement and then work down to the body and I'll do parts individually that way. But in terms of starting out and with workflow and all that, it's always draw order first 
then deform a hierarchy. That's the basic setup that I've done here. And then art meshes. So every single part I will make a mesh for. And then we actually get onto the rigging part. And with a deformer hierarchy, I make sure to keep within it as I'm going along. Even with my basic setup here, I will need to make more deformers on top of this. But I take it as I go, personally. I do know some people who start off with basically all of their deformers set up initially. But in my opinion, I tend to find that I end up needing more deformers than I start off with. Which is why I like to work this way, basically. But in terms of time scale, for a model like this one, like Tala, it will probably take me around 30 hours working on it. For Alfie, the one I'm currently using, it's currently into at least 60 hours. So it completely depends on how complex your character is. Here's another question from Freytana. When laying out the texture atlas, do the meshes of elements overlapping cause issues or just the raw pixels of an element? The answer to this is yes. And I will show you exactly what can happen if you're not careful with your mesh. And we're going to go ahead and open up our texture atlas here. So once you're on the texture atlas here, you'll see that the parts are outlined in a blue so the blue area is the outline of your mesh and you must, must not have this overlapping any other part. The reason is this blue area is any visible area for that part. You may have remembered earlier that I mentioned when you're creating mesh that it will affect the visible area of your part. So if you didn't have mesh in an area, then that part of the art will not be visible. And basically, if you have any parts that are not included in a mesh, it will delete it. You won't be able to see it at all. However, this also goes for the texture atlas here. If, for example, I had this blue overlapping. So let's say this was even just overlapping a little bit into the tip of this little knife here. You see this part here where the blue is overlapping. This part will be visible on my face part. You'll notice that this part of the knife is in our head range. So once we export this, that's going to show. And you're going to get a really awkward part on your face that will move with it. So just try to avoid overlapping the blue areas. So the next question we have is from Seraphim Kimiko. What is the biggest misconception people perpetuate about Life 2D in your opinion? Hmm, that's actually a difficult one to think about. Um... A lot of things that I see is that Life 2D is difficult or is not very accessible, um, which really confuses me because there is actually a free version to the program. Although the free version does have limitations, it still gives you enough tools to be able to learn the program. Um, and in terms of difficulty, it's really not that hard if you learn all of the basic tools and learn all of these core concepts like we covered in this video today. Mesh is one of the core concepts of Live 2D and it's something that you shouldn't be avoiding. <laughs> and I have a few other videos up on the channel of stuff that is really not pointed out very often um, but is a core part of Live 2D such as the deformer hierarchy and physics as well. I have a physics 101 video, which covers all of the nitty gritty. <laughs> Life 2D definitely more tedious than it is hard. So make sure that you have set out plenty of time uh, to rig your model. Don't expect to rush through it and have a perfect model. It will take you time and a lot of patience. And next, we have another question from Nixie the Vampy. Are you self-taught? How long did it take for you to feel confident in your rigging skills? Very, very good question indeed. So I am entirely self-taught and I started about a year and three-ish months ago. And back then, we really didn't have many tutorials on how to use Live2D. So 
um, I started off with the very, very basic live to do tutorials that you might see on the startup screen. Um, plus the Japanese guide, because luckily I can read Japanese enough to get through the tutorials on the website. Um, but most of my actual learning was just through playing around in the program. So uh, I'm personally, I think I learn best by doing. Uh, and obviously everyone has different styles of learning. Um, personally, I preferred to actually get in and just get hands on with a model and just start start trying things, see what everything does. And I actually, I actually made a video specifically for that purpose for people who are brand new and want to jump into live 2d it covers all of the stuff that went through my head when i first started and i was like huh what do i need to learn what do i need to use in this program that video will cover it and my biggest advice is just get into it keep going you've got this if Live 2D is for you, you will know. Absolutely. Absolutely. If Live 2D is not fun for you, then I wouldn't recommend forcing yourself through it because it is a long and tedious process. So if you are doing some rigging, make sure that you're having fun with the process. If not, take a break or perhaps it might not be for you. So do bear that in mind. We have a question from Professor Tiberius. If you have meshes that move on their own, do they work off the same timer or do they have their own? So there is several different ways to make things move on their own. The most common is to put things on the breathing parameter. So you may notice that when I'm idle, my chest does actually puff up and inward whilst I'm breathing because that is all set up on our breathing parameter within Live2D. That is the very basic version. But there's also stuff that you can do with both physics and animation. So with physics, in all technicality, this is still using our breathing parameter. However, we've set it up in a way that it works with physics. So this is set up with breath as our input but with this long pendulum snake-like thing here. So you can see that this is affecting my tail and you can see as the pendulum swings, my tail swings with it. So this is its own thing. And if I had a shorter pendulum here, it would be a bit faster than how it is currently going. So in a way that is kind of on its own timer, um, the next thing would be idle animations, which for example here, you may notice with my ears every now and then, they do a little wiggle. <laughs> and this is actually my own idle animation that I've set up. I do have a video on using the animation tool in Live2D actually. And basically you can set up a animation loop to have this on your own preset timer. So I believe my ears go off once every few seconds um, apart from each other. And so that allows you a little bit more control over the specific timing of things. So we're going to use the actual idle animation example here with controlling the times of things for automatic movement. So you can see on my timeline here, I have all of these points set up to do this ear wiggle movement. And then there is a pause before this loops again. So I can actually add a pause by increasing the length of my timeline like this before it repeats again. Because when you're setting up an idle animation in Live 2D, it will take this whole timeline into account. So in theory, if I decrease this to here, it will make my ears wiggle way more often. Like so. But obviously I like having the little bit of a delay before it goes. So I would increase this. To there. And then after one set of wiggles, it waits until it wiggles again.
there we go so that was all of my burning questions from twitch if you would like to ask me more i am planning to do more sort of rigging streams and q and a streams as well that would be very fun but i hope i answered everyone's questions sufficiently and with that i hope you have a wonderful day do take care of yourselves and have fun with live 2d and bye 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 bye